Okay, the children are then dismissed. The younger ones, right? Yeah. Okay. The older ones have to stay. It's not a punishment. <laughs> I think my wife has probably heard this story a few times through the years that I've preached, so she'll have to close her ears as I share it one more time. I must have been around six years old. It was during the week leading up to Christmas. We were getting excited, probably too excited, because I must have done something wrong, because I was banished to the basement of our house. That was the worst punishment for me. Um, it wasn't a modern basement with windows. It was an old basement with stone walls, loose plaster, cobwebs everywhere, and a coal fire furnace. One of those big belly jobs, you know, with a grate on the door. And we had an auger that was covered in a wooden box that led from the coal bin to the furnace. Yes, that's how old I am. We had a coal fire <laughs> furnace in Winnipeg in the winter. So the old furnace was blazing and it was causing weird and eerie looking shadows on the floor of the basement. And the boiler was making loud noises and there was a, that auger that was running and making noise. And I was very afraid. In that darkness, it's only natural that my imagination just takes over and I just knew that there were all kinds of horrid and ghastly monsters just waiting to pounce on me. And at this point you need to know that I was raised as a German who was familiar with the Grimm Brothers fairy tales. <laughs> Grimm Brothers are horrible. Like, I don't, that's why Germans are so bad. <laughs> As they learn about, you know, wolves being cut open and grandma jumping out and stuffing the wolf's stomach full of rocks and throwing him in the well and stuff like this, you know, or anyway, I'm not gonna, it's a dis destruction. <laughs> so uh, you need to know that their fairy tales are filled with violence and blood. So, of course, I would stay at the top of the stairs of the basement and as long as I could press my ear against the door that led to the kitchen and as long as I could see some of the light from the kitchen coming through those cracks in the door I could keep those monsters at bay. Nothing would happen to me. That light and the sounds of the kitchen was like oxygen to me. I needed that. Let me ask you a question. How many people are living in self-imposed basements of darkness? How many are facing demons and monsters in their own lives and spending all of their energies keeping those monsters at bay? How many people have their eyes pressed to a crack in the door of hope where a little light is shining through and you might be that light? They see the light shining through and they have no idea that there's a doorknob called faith that they can reach and turn. Yet they fear that the light will expose their hearts. But yet they need that light and they know it. Therefore they choose the odd comfort of a covering darkness which isolates them from genuine life. That's the picture. Do you see it? Mankind is the little boy locked in the dark basement of purposeless living. It's an existence of never daring to truthfully ask what life is all about. For fear of getting the answer that you already know in your heart. It's a basement of fear and loneliness and uncertainty. It's the fear of not knowing who you are and yet knowing that true life lies in giving up your self-existence 
and your self-preoccupation and the wearing of your own crown and the propping up of your own little kingdom for something much bigger than your own existence and your self-made kingdom. And along comes Jesus Christ, the light of the world, and he opens the door and the light floods in and he says, verse 12, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. This harkens back to chapter 1, verse 4 of the Gospel of John. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Or other translations have, did not overcome it, or did not understand it. <clears throat> This statement, along with other statements that Jesus makes in this chapter, puts Jesus on a collision course with the authorities. <clears throat> statements that he made, like, verse 21, You will die in your sins because you cannot come where I am going. Jesus claimed again and again, If you do not believe that I am the Messiah, you will die in your sins. Then he said in verse 25, You who sit in judgment over me do not realize that I will judge you. Or this, and I'm just summarizing. When you judge and execute me, in other words, he told them, when you lift me up, on the cross that is, then you will know and recognize that I am who I have claimed to be all along. And here's a question for you. How in the world will they recognize him as the Messiah as he hangs on the cross, a broken body, and bleeding, and blood dripping down along the cross to the ground? Where is there any glory in that? How would that be recognized as the Messiah? Yet Jesus says, when you judge and execute me, you will know and recognize that I am who I say I am. So let's start with this first statement. If you cannot go where Jesus is going, you will die in your sins. Well, where is Jesus going? Is there any place on earth that the Pharisees cannot go? If Jesus was referring to some geographical place on earth, there is no place that the Pharisees would not be able to follow him. So obviously Jesus is not referring to some place on the earth. Notice that the Pharisees were puzzled about this statement. They were not focused on the fact that Jesus told them that they would die in their sins. They're focused on, like, where is he going? They responded with this. Will he kill himself? Is that why he says, when I go, you cannot come? Now stop and think about that. Will he kill himself? Because if he kills himself, then obviously we're not going to go to that place. What are they saying? They are saying that, no, we're not dying in our sins, you are. They're saying to Jesus, you're going to end up in hell. Because we're going to heaven. Of course, we are the Pharisees. We are the gatekeepers of our religion. It's a statement that they make that entails both mockery and arrogance. And I want to explain you ever notice that when mockery and verbal bullying takes place, it's most effectively done with peers. Individuals seldom mock others when they're by themselves. And I can just picture them winking at each other and smirking to each other about this and kind of gaining confidence by what they said, you know? You know how it works. They are confident that they're going to be among those who will be resurrected in the kingdom, and in their mind, Jesus won't be there. I have no doubt that they think that they will be among the ultimate privilege class in heaven. This was the conservative, the ultra-conservative crowd in Judaism, the orthodox ones. They were the ones who practiced tithing right down to figuring out how much one-tenth of their salt is or their pepper, 
their spices. They had their theological ducks in a row and they were practicing their laws. Now picture the theological pride as they look to each other and smirk while mocking Jesus with the statement, will he kill himself? That he says, we cannot go where he's going. Because they assume they're going to heaven. And Jesus is saying that where he's going, they cannot come. That must mean he's going to hell. And committing suicide is a sure way of getting there because they believed that suicide was like an unforgivable sin. Let me stop here and just briefly address this issue of theological pride. I've experienced this, and I, I'm sure many of you have experienced theological pride as well. If you haven't, then you haven't recognized it. I can smell it. Once you've been there, you can smell it. I thank God that in those early days, a lot of my friends and my family were gracious to me and invited me back into fellowship with them because I was the one who cut them off in those days of spiritual pride. And I would have deserved not being accepted back in. And there are one or two that still have trouble accepting me. I mention this because often in fellowships where there is good Orthodox Bible teaching, and I hope that that's what we're doing here, there is the tendency that theological knowledge becomes the object of pursuit. Theological knowledge is what people are after, and they forget that theological knowledge is meant to aid you in the pursuit of Christ, in the pursuit of knowing God better, so that he can change the heart more and more. Remember at the very beginning of the series, we went to, I believe it was first, Second Peter chapter 1, where it talks about where God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. And that listed all the qualities and characteristics of Christ that are to become ours, virtues of Christ that are supposed to live in us. And the more we get to know Christ, the more these virtues develop in us, the more our character grows and becomes Christ-like. That's the aim. That's what we are to be after with all the energy that we have. And so theology, theology is the study of God, doesn't become an end in itself. Theology is there, the study of God is there, the study of God's Word is there, so that we can get to know Him better. And if you stop somewhere along the way and become proud of what you know theologically, you've pitched your tent in the wrong place. Because that wasn't the aim of theology at all. And I've got to confess that Northland Bible College was kind of known for mistakenly pitching their tent on theological knowledge and not the pursuit of Christ. And I'm one of those students from the old days and I must confess that that's where I was for years. And it stinks, it stinks. I have nothing against theological knowledge, nothing against the study of theology. In fact, I encourage it. But you've got to keep this in mind, that the study of theology is for the sake of knowing Christ more and more. Spiritual pride is so far from real spirituality, and it is fatally deceptive. These men in John chapter 8 are going to hell. That's what it means to die in your sins. You're going to hell. You're condemned. It means to die with unforgiven sin. It means you have to face God in judgment with that unforgiven sin. Imagine the courtroom scene, and you're going to be there in front of God, the judge, Jesus Christ, the judge. And your pretenses are all going to be gone. And you're going to have, you, you will be forced to be gut level honest. And you will admit 
that you rejected God, that you rejected Jesus Christ in favor of nurturing your own ego. In other words, you were a God to yourself. That was your idol. Dying in your sin means that you will live consciously with the regret and the guilt of your actions, not just in this life, but forever. Dying in your sin means you will live forever with the reality that you missed eternal life by those wrong decisions that you made in this life. Death is unavoidable. Death is final. But it is possible to avoid judgment. You cannot avoid death, but you can avoid judgment. Jesus, in his mercy, is going to tell these Pharisees how they can avoid judgment. But first, another question. Why did Jesus say, you will look for me after I'm gone? You will look for me. Did the Jewish leaders look for him after he died? Not that I'm aware of. The Bible doesn't say anything about them looking for him unless they went searching for where he must have been buried after the disciples stole his body away. That's what they thought happened. The disciples must have stolen his body. That's the rumor that they spread. Did they look for him after he died? Are they looking for Messiah today? Yeah, they sure are. They're looking for the Messiah. His words have come true. They're looking for him. But he is the one and only Messiah and deliverer. And if they reject him, there is no other. There is no other Messiah who is coming. So Jesus continues in verse 23. He explains to them why they cannot follow him unless they do something. He tells them that they are from below and that he is from above. This is similar to what happened in John chapter 6 where he talks about being the bread of heaven who has come from above. He is of divine origin and they are of sinful human origin and in fact being energized by the spirit of this world, Satan himself. Here we have echoes of John chapter 3 where Jesus says, flesh gives birth to flesh but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again or from above. I think probably it's better interpreted as from above. You must be born from above. But of course, when we are born from above, we are born again. That's why Nicodemus asked, how can a man Return to his mother's womb and be born again. It's kind of impossible. But he says, if you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. Here's the remedy. You must believe that I am the one I claim to be. Well, how does that happen? How does it happen that I am saved when I believe that Jesus is the one who he claims to be. Have you not experienced individuals who have said, yeah, yeah, I believe. In fact, I've heard people say that with a swear word. You know, you're, you're, I can't say it. <laughs> uh, and it makes no difference in their lives. Well, do they really believe it? What are the implications if I say I believe? Well, the implications, if I say I believe that Jesus is the judge of all mankind, that Jesus is the one who died on the cross, that Jesus is the one who said, if you don't believe in me, you will die in your sins. If I believe that, it's going to have an effect on my life. It's going to change things on the inside of me because he moves in. He moves into my life and he begins to transform me on the inside and his characteristics become my characteristics and the character qualities that I was known for before I become a Christian, particularly as an adult, those characteristics begin to fall off. Yeah. 
So belief isn't just a simple nod, a mental affirmation. Yeah, yeah, I believe. Like so many that I met in Liburn who had been to Galilean Bible Camp as kids, who raised their hand or walked the aisle or signed a card or did something that made them think that they became Christians. And then they went back home after a week of euphoric existence at Bible Camp with parents who had never darkened the door of church, who party every weekend to the max, who have different partners every three years, and they grow up in that context and forget about what happened at Bible camp, and then I meet them as a 30-year-old adult who themselves now have been divorced and remarried and have several kids from different families who are drinking themselves on weekends, and I talk to them about Jesus. Oh, yeah, I did that a long time ago. Yeah, I believe in Jesus. Oh, where's the change? No, belief means something. Belief changes you. It's so simple. Noah had a simple message to tell the people of his day. If you don't repent and get on this ark, you will die because God is coming to judge the earth with a flood. How hard is that to understand? How can you dummy that down? As the angel of death passed over the land of Egypt, those who obeyed God's instructions were saved from the angel of death. What were the instructions? Kill a lamb, take the blood to mark your door with red, and the angel of death will pass over you. That's where we get the word Passover from. How hard is that to understand? In the wilderness, people were being bitten by poisonous snakes. Moses went to God. God gave him a remedy. Put up a serpent on a pole, a brass serpent, and then when people look at the brass serpent, they will not be harmed by the venom. Is that difficult to understand? It's so simple. Jesus said in John 3, 15, Just as Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in Him has eternal life. Is that difficult? God's message of salvation cannot be any simpler. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved is all that Paul told the Philippian jailer when he asked, what do I have to do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the message that's given to this audience in the temple. That's the message given to the very ones who are mocking him. Unless you believe in me, you're going to die in your sins. Look at their response. Who do you think you are? They ask the question, who are you? Time and time again, he's telling them who he is. Sometimes cryptically, cryptically, and sometimes not so cryptically. You could say, who do you think you are, Jesus? Or maybe, how can you say that? That's what they're asking him. Jesus repeats, to his critics here that he is who he has been claiming to be all along. There is no way they can miss it. The Son of God, the Messiah, and their Redeemer. I don't know how people say there is no place in the Bible where Jesus claims to be the Son of God. There's no place in the Bible where Jesus claims to be God. There is, absolutely. They can't miss it. Jesus' critics are acting like his judge and will also be his executioners, but he's telling them that he will be their judge and he implies that he will have a whole lot to say in judgment to them. It's not going to just be, you're guilty, be gone. I think just like in today's courts, a judge will sometimes lecture a criminal. I believe that Jesus is going to have a whole lot to say to these individuals who have rejected. And I think he's going to po point out to them where they missed it and where they purposely rejected it so that they could feed their own egos, so they could build their own empires. It's kind of ironic that Jesus now is showing them the way of salvation 
and he would still delight to grant them forgiveness and redemption. But the very communication of that redemption drives another nail into Jesus' coffin, so to speak. The more he offers them salvation, the more they have to say, he can't be the Messiah. We're not going to let him be the Messiah. We reject him. And next, Jesus says something amazing. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. And that's where he stops. In italics, you'll have, I am who I say I am, or something like that. But the clause stops there. You will know that I am. Sounds like an incomplete sentence, but it's not. Because the words I am, of course, is how God made himself known to Moses. Whom shall I say has sent me, Moses asked. And God says, tell them the I am that I am has sent you. The all-sufficient one. The one who needs nothing from the outside. I am all-sufficient. Think about this. Jesus says, when you have lifted me up, you will know that I am. How can the sight of a battered and bleeding body on a Roman cross inspire anyone to believe that this is the God of the universe? This is the one who created all that is. And his blood is dripping down from the cross and his body is almost lifeless. And he heaves painfully as he takes his breath. He looks helpless. He looks weak and emaciated. His flesh is torn off of his body from the multiple scourgings that he got. How can this be the light of the world, the bread of life, the resurrection and the life, the great I am? If you know with what horror the Jews regarded the cross, it becomes even a greater dilemma. Because, of course, the Old Testament says, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Why did God put that in there? Because he knew one day that Jesus Christ, his son, would be hanging on a tree. And that he would be the cursed one. Because he is now bearing your sins and my sins on himself. He is bearing the guilt that was yours and mine in himself. And those who have ears to hear and eyes to see will recognize that he is the one. That this is the way in which God conquers the world. Not through force, not by coming on a white stallion and announcing with prophets that God has arrived on earth and will force everyone to bend the knee. But he comes as a peasant child. He comes to seek and to save that which is lost. Lives in poverty. Lives as a reject in his own family. Lives as a reject among his own people. Lives a, long, a life of humility. And then, on the cross. In the Psalms, we read words that capture prophetically Jesus' own horrendous experience. I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. That's Psalm 22. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. This was written hundreds of years before Christ walked the earth. How do you explain that? 
So why did Jesus make this astounding statement that when I hang on the cross, you will see me for who I really am? How can this reveal him as the Son of God? I have to think the centurion's remark, and I don't know who else listened to him that day and who actually converted to Christ. Verse 54 in John, I believe it was. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake, this must have been Matthew, and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. I wonder what fear must have entered into these individuals when they saw the temple curtain torn from top to bottom. This is the holiest place in all of Israel, the Holy of Holies, where the priests could walk in just once a year, and even at that they had to be very, very careful how they proceeded in that Holy of Holies or they would be struck dead. And the temple curtain is torn from top to bottom. Or when the sky grew black in the middle of the day, or when the earthquake shook the city of Jerusalem, or when those Old Testament saints, some of them, were raised from the dead in that earthquake. I wonder if, if any of them ever thought to themselves, what have we done? What have we done? Have we slaughtered the very Son of God? In the very act of lifting this man called Jesus up on the cross, he has become our judge. And we, the Pharisees, will be judged by God for executing the Messiah. Remember that while Jesus was being nailed to the cross, he prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I wonder if Others who were watching did know what they were doing. Certainly the disciples began to recognize, I'm sure. Can you imagine what judgment lays in store for them? Maybe similar to that of Judas, of whom it was said it would have been better for him not to have been born. Let's remember these religious leaders were only part of the story. The more important part of the story is that it was our sins that put them there. We weren't there, but our sins put them there. And that was the reason he allowed all of this to happen. He could have stopped it. But he did it to provide a remedy for our sins. I've told this story before, but a dream I had when I actually killed someone, murdered him. I remember that dread feeling in that dream. There is no remedy for this. You cannot ask for forgiveness of this person that you just killed. You cannot undo what you have done. You cannot walk yourself back in time and change your mind. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, that you can do except carry the guilt of what you've done for the rest of your life. And I woke up because my Christian consciousness didn't enter into that dream. But when I woke up, I recognized what happened. And I said, oh, yes. But get this. Every one of our sins are like that. There is no sin on earth that you can walk back and undo. There is no remedy for sin. There's nothing you can do. Once you crucify someone with your words, once you mock someone, once you steal something, once you commit adultery, there's nothing you can do to undo it. There is no remedy except that the God who created the laws that we live by has created a remedy, a way back to him by offering you forgiveness. And you get forgiveness for free. But God, in the person of Jesus Christ, paid the price for you. What would you have to pay if you were paying for your own sins? An eternity in hell. That's the price that Jesus paid when he suffered on the cross. He paid the price 
for your sin, the penalty for your sin. His death for those three days was the equivalent of my eternity in hell. He was able to pay it and come back from the dead because he lived a holy life, a spotless life, a sinless life. And because he was the Son of God, is the Son of God. Unless you believe in the Son of Man, you will die in your sins. But if you believe in Jesus, you will be not die in your sins. Please remember the image of that child hugging the inside of that door in the basement, who sees the light through the crack in the door. May you be motivated to be the light for that person that you know and love, but who lives in that dark basement filled with demons and monsters. And let's pray for their redemption. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for your living word. And we pray, Lord, that we may be motivated to be your witnesses wherever we go, whether it's simply by our life, because Jesus lives in us and people will see Jesus, whether it's by our words, whether it's by our actions, may people see Jesus and live. In your name I pray. Amen.